and these are in listen only mode. Okay, hello and welcome to the Under This Rule Ask Carlos Anything webinar. Apologize for uh, the technical difficulties. We're going to run through some ground rules and do our shameless plug up front. Um, and that'll take about five minutes, and then we're going to turn it right over to Q&A. Uh, Martin Gwynn, the Director of Operations for Hit the Survival Guide, will be fielding questions, gathering the questions, and then asking me. Uh, please let Martin know via chat. We are assuming everybody can hear uh, just fine. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Freelance Publishing, I'm the co-author of the Hit the Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. So the ground rules, these were the ground rules that we set up before uh, the webinar that were on the advertisements for the webinar. So questions have to be in the form of hypotheticals, no specifics, no names. We need to, we need to do this to protect the guilty. This can't be legal advice that you're asking for in this form. So it's got to be in the form of a hypothetical. Uh, we said that questions would not, could not be submitted ahead of time. We know some of you submitted some questions, but the ground rules were no questions ahead of time, so you're just going to have to get in the queue. Uh, and any questions that were readily answered by the slides uh, that we distributed won't be entertained because it's ground that we've already covered. So we're hoping to cover new ground today, um, and we're going to be selective about which questions uh, we answer. If you can just read the slides and, and get answers to questions, we're not, um, we're not going to cover those. Uh, there's been lots of questions about individual liability. This isn't found anywhere in the rules. It's like a guideline or something put out by HHS, whether individuals or just the practices can be held liable. As you hear, as you see in red here, individuals such as directors, employees, officers of the covered entity, where the covered entity is not an individual, may also be directly criminally liable under HIPAA in accordance with principles of corporate criminal liability. That definitely applies uh, to criminal liability. It, this particular guidance didn't say anything about civil liability, but I think civil liability it could be applied to uh, officers and directors as well. And this final sentence, where an individual of a covenant entity is not directly li liable under HIPAA, they can still be charged with conspiracy or aiding and abetting. I mean, this often comes up if a privacy officer knows that uh, they're violating the rule because the doctor or the executive said, no, we're put that way. Is there individual liability? My answer, uh, we're going to get further guidance. Obviously, the, the, the federal courts are going to weigh in on this. My answer would be there would be liability for the executive and for the privacy officer for um, uh, knowingly violating the rule. So a little shameless plug. We're going to run through this real quick. I'm going I'm to briefly talk to you about how to navigate the regulatory maze which many of you are experiencing right now, and really, you know, if if you if you filled in the blanks and you think that that's enough, you really haven't been paying attention for the last couple of years. Um, you know, so it is a regulatory maze. The risk uh, of high tech HIPAA uh, compliance is real, it's significant, and it's grown every day as the industry moves to ACOs, EHRs, cloud services, mobile devices. I don't need to tell you guys this. You've been living the change that's going on in healthcare right now, all that increases uh, the liability. The liability can, you know, can be in millions of dollars. You all know this from the, from the breach fines that you've seen. Uh, it can come from various vectors, HHS fines, state attorney general lawsuits, class action lawsuits, and worst of all, probably reputation damages from all of the above. Uh, and you, 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 you got to know that any tr non-trivial violation, for example, a breach, is almost certainly going to result in fines that could start at $50,000 per violation if your organization is found to be in willful neglect. And, and those fines can go up to a million and a half per identical violation. This is really a clarifying point that HHS brought out. Per identical violation, that means that the $1.5 million is not a maximum Fine. That's the way I understand that clarification. You are definitely going to experience significant disruption to your business if you have a breach or a lawsuit and likely have lasting damage to your organization's brand. So you want to avoid that at all costs. Our products and services um, help organizations with this daunting challenge essentially by avoiding the maze altogether. We provide you the scaffolding uh, and the foundation that helps you 
eliminate this maze and get started right away. So our subscription plan and our products provide step-by-step -step guidance that allow you to jumpstart your HIPAA high tech omnibus rule compliance initiative. And I mean more than just fill in the blank templates and policies. If you don't have processes, if you don't have tracking mechanisms, you're still likely going to be found in willful neglect plan. So what you got to be able to provide is visible demonstrable evidence, policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms uh, if you want to be found to be in compliance. And compliance is going to be something that you do over time. So I want to be clear here because I get asked this question all the time. For the subscription plan, it includes all the products that you find on our website, all our training modules, all our checklists, model policies, procedures, templates, and tools, live links to the statutes and regulations, and more. We're going to be adding more and more to our subscription plan, like recording these webinars and making it available for our subscribers. Get all that, all those products, all updates, any new products for $7.95. 95 for the first year. Second year is optional, but it's 495.95 if you want to continue to receive new products and updates. Once you pay the 795.95 for the first year, you get all our products. You can download them and start using them today. So we provide you the recipe and not just the ingredients. We obviously can't come into the into the kitchen and cook it for you. So you know, I get asked this question all the time: What do I need to do to be in compliance? Like you're going to be in compliance day one if you just fill in these model policies. That's not going to happen. I mean, you can fill in the policies, but that ain't being in compliance. You need a lot more. You need the processes and you need the tracking mechanism. This is something that you're going to be working on over the next three, two to three months just to, just to get it uh, instantiated in, in a way that you can make a good faith argument to HHS and the court of law that you, you are not in willful neglect. So, the subscription plan is allow, it, it allows you to start executing on that program. And I mean program, not just model templates on day one. Okay, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you want to keep track of us, we're doing a, a, a we're going to be doing two webinars a month. We're going to be reinstituting Blog Talk Radio. Best way to do that is through our newsletter. Here's the URL. You don't need to write these down. We're going to be distributing these slides. So you have the URL. You can follow us on Facebook, or you can join the conversation on LinkedIn. Breach notification webinar on October 10th, 2013. It's always going to be at from 2 to 3.30 Eastern time. On the second and fourth Thursdays uh, of each month, the times will be fixed. Blog Talk Radio is going to be on Fridays. We're going to do something we call Five Minute Fridays. But the show will actually last from 2 to 2.30. And again, the specifics of how you can you know, log into the show and follow the show, all that is going to be in our newsletter. So that's what you need to do to, uh, to keep track of the dates and register and all that. So I uh, just want to conclude before we start Q&A that hopefully you know that we're not in Kansas anymore. This is not the old HIPAA. This is HIPAA 2.0. Definitely not your daddy's HIPAA. Anymore, I'm going to continue to see you on the wires, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Q&A and Martin. I, I suspect we have some questions, probably. Yes, we. Yes, we do. Uh, Sherry would like to know what requirements must be met with respect to use, use and disclosure for providers who opt to create an internet landing page for potential patients in gathering the person's name, contact information, and date of birth? Well, there are no, there, you know, I mean, you can gather, you can gather patient information on a patient portal. There are no specific um, internet requirements for uses and disclosure. You've got to follow the uses and disclosure guidelines that are contained in the privacy rule. And the section is that you want to start is the general rule. It's going to be 164.502. That list, that goes through a laundry list of permitted and, not, and unpermitted uses and disclosures. There is one definite requirement if you have an Internet portal or an Internet site where you're providing services to patients, and that is that your notice of privacy practices, your NOPP, has to prominently be displayed on your website so that uh, a patient coming to your website and obtaining services for the first time sees and, and, and somehow says, I agree to 
the notice of privacy practices, that's the same notice of privacy practices that you would hand the patient should they walk into your uh, ambulatory practice. That's the one that HHS and the Ombudsman School said there were material changes to, which meant that uh, covered entities that are providers need to distribute their new NOPP to all new patients. You don't have to go back in time and distribute the, any, uh, every patient that ever walked through the door, but to all new patients. And if you're a health plan, you have to update it and distribute it to all people on the plan, all patients on the plan regardless. So that, that's the distinction. But other than that, if, if there are no distinctions. You have to use and disclose information on the internet just consistent with the privacy rule. Okay, Rose has a few questions. Let's start with the first one. Um, is it a requirement to provide your CEs NOPP to a BAA? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand that question. I mean, the, 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 there has to be a, a, a BAA between a CE and a business associate, right? So all the direct business associates with the CE have to sign an agreement. It doesn't matter if it's the CE's agreement or the BA's agreement because it's a contract between the parties. You, you know, you're both signing this contract. Uh, and there has to be a contract between a BA and its sub. Now, you know, you got to go back to the definitions of business associate and subcontractor. If the business associate is using PHI to perform a business function on behalf of the covered entity, that's the definition of business associate. If a subcontractor is using PHI to perform a, a business function on behalf of the BA, then they're also a business associate, and they have to comply. You have to have agreements both with your subs and your covered entities. So whose agreement gets signed, it's, it, it doesn't really matter, right? It, 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 both parties have to sign it. So in that, in that respect, it's just like any other contract. The, the question was a little more specific. Does the CE have to provide the NOP to the BA? No, 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 no. I mean, unless the BA has been delegated the responsibility to distribute it, the NOPP is for patients, not, not, not for BAs. Uh, Rose's second question. Is a bank a BAA if they receive EOBs in the CE's lockbox? Is a, is a bank? Yes. Ask me the question. Is a bank a business associate if they receive EOBs in the CE's lockbox? You know, I mean, that's a... I'm assuming EOB stands for an explanation of benefits, right? But you got to go back to first principles. You know, that's a specific question. The first principle is: is it is that EOB PHI? Is it patient identifiable information? If the bank is receiving patient identifiable information or protected health information that identifies patients, obviously that's sort of the, the definition. Then and, and it's performing a business function on behalf of the CE. Then it, then yes. If EOB doesn't contain any PHI, then no. It, do, it doesn't. It's not every. It's not every relationship, business relationship that a covered entity has, that makes that party a BA. You got to go back to the definition of is the BA is the partner using protected health information to provide a business function on behalf of the CE. For example, if I'm a CE's lawyer, but I never see PHI ever, then I'm not a business associate. If I'm a CE's lawyer and I, or a BA, and I go on site, and part of what they want me to do is look at protected health, health information to perform my business function, then I'm a BA and I got to comply. That's, that's the rule. Okay. This is from Cindy. What is the responsibility of a covered entity? in interpreting and following the technical guidelines for compliance, access, audit, integrity, security for text messaging, and alphanumeric paging that contains PHI? Yeah, this, this question comes up in a lot of different forms. 
Okay, let me start with it, 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 it's essentially a question partly partly having to do with the security rule. Now, I, at least I'm going to answer it first in, in light of the security rule, and then we can talk about a potential privacy rule violation. Okay, the security rule the security rule has standards, and standards have implementation specifications, and implementation specifications can be either required or addressable. Okay? If it's required, you have to implement it, period. Okay? You have to implement the specification. If it's addressable, you still have to implement the uh, uh, specification, but if you don't implement the specification as written, you can implement a, a, an alternative specification, an alternative solution, if you provide a compelling reason why you've implemented the alternative, and if you implement, if you decide not to implement it, you really better have a super compelling reason why and document that. So you can't ignore any of the requirements. Now, that question generally pertains to sending things over clear text. It could be alphanumeric pagers. It could be email over the internet. And here, here's the answer. It's a two-part answer. One, encryption is not a, encryption is an addressable requirement under the security rule. It's not mandated, but you know it's probably going to be found to be reasonable and appropriate if if you should ever have a breach. Okay, now just the fact that you do it, right? Just the fact that you do it because it's addressable is not per se a violation. Okay, now. It's going to be a violation, probably, because it's going to be found today not to be reasonable and appropriate to do it. Clear text over a pager, clear text over the internet where anybody could intercept it. But just the very fact of doing it is not going to be a violation. Now, that's the security rule part of the answer. The privacy rule part of the answer is you obviously can't be doing it, sending alphanumeric pagers, pages, even if they were encrypted, to people who shouldn't be receiving it. Right? That's an inappropriate use and disclosure in violation of the privacy rule. But I don't think that's the context of the question. This is like sending this between providers and people that are, are, are exchanging information, PHI for treatment, have a legitimate right to know, but they're sending it over clear text. So it's not a per se violation. If things go wrong, they're going to get whacked. All right. Let's answer Kurt's question now. What if a patient's statement is sent to the wrong address? Would that be considered a breach? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, unless you can establish that there's a low probability that it had PHI and the PHI wasn't compromised, if you sent it to the wrong address, I don't think you're going to be able to, to meet your burden of proof of you know that it was that 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 the, that the PHI in question wasn't compromised. It's a breach. It's got to report it. Jeannie would like to know what would janitorial services need a BAA or just a confidentiality agreement? Well, actually, there, there's guidance on HHS's website, and HHS has done a pretty good job. And, and, you know, over the years, and, and has continued to put out more content. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, it, it begs more questions than it answers. And same can be said of the NIST documents. But the answer to that question is that there is no BAA required if the service provided uh, is incidental. If, if contact with P PHI is completely incidental to uh, the business function that. Uh, the business partner provides. Janitorial service do not require PHI to perform their business function on behalf of the provider. Okay, it's incidental too, and you probably want a confidentiality agreement. You may want to train them, but you know that's the guidance that uh, HHS has provided. If it's incidental too, so janitorial companies, you know, uh, people that take care of the lawn people to take care of your indoor plan. I mean, there's a bunch of partners like that. They don't require PHI to perform their business function. I would probably give them, just make them sign a confidentiality agreement, make them, you know, do a little training uh, to say how important PHI is. They can't really do it, but they don't, you don't, you don't need the agreement. 
Marcus has a future question. Will audits shift from a com complaint-driven process to some other proactive process? Yes. That was mandated by the High Tech Act. I think it's Section 13410. And any of these sections that I quote, you can go out on, on the HIPAA Survival Guide and get the full text. Uh, HHS is mandated to come up with a methodology that's probably going to be like the IRS, you know, random methodology of picking providers of uh, covered entities of all sizes and conducting audits. Now they haven't, they haven't yet issued any guidance with respect to that methodology, but the high, that's one of the like remaining rulemaking pieces of the High Tech Act that, that that's not complete. The other one, since we're on this topic, is the fact that. HHS was also mandated to come up with a methodology whereby patients that complain and that complaint leads to a fine, patients will then share in the proceeds of the fine and, oh, by the way, all the proceeds of the fines go back to HHS. So HHS has a, this is as per the High Tech Act, HHS has a virtual money machine to keep funding more enforcement actions. and. To be clear, because I know this causes a lot of confusion, causes a lot of confusion for law students when they're first studying the law, clearly causes confusion for lay people. Look, all this rulemaking, including the omnibus rule and the, and the changes that the omnibus rule drove to the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, and the enforcement rule, all of that comes from the height 99.95%. There were a few occasions where HHS, under its own authority, issue some rulemaking, but 99.95% comes from the statute. The statute is the law, the regulations is secondary authority. Now, we all tend to think of HIPAA as the regulations, because that's where most of us go to, and you know what I mean? That's what we try to comply with, etc. You got to keep in mind that the High Tech Act was promulgated in 2009, February 2009, was the driver and is the primary authority for all of this. Okay. Francis, what should a CE do if after several attempts, I think she means a signed contract, BAA is not received timely? Well, you know, I mean, the obvious answer to that is you got to have a BA. If you don't have a BA, you're in violation. You need to terminate. You need to send them notice that you're not going to do business with them. You know, now the, the, now the omnibus rule made it optional to report in the case where you did have a contract, but, the, but the, let's say the, the BA or the CE, because now reciprocal monitoring is in play, uh, was in material breach. And one party, the party not in breach, found out about it. You gotta you gotta bring it to the other party's attention. You gotta cure, you know, and and if you can't cure, you gotta cut off the business relationship. And if you can't, if, if for some reason you can't for whatever reason, you gotta report it. You used to have to report it to the secretary. That's optional now. The reporting to the secretary, but in our model contract, I suggest I suggested that you leave that in because as a you know as a cover your butt, I would report. Hey. You know, I have this business relationship, this VA won't cure, won't fix. We really can't drop them right now because, you know, it's critical until we get this other replacement VA. I would report that. But if you don't have a VA in place at all, the CE ought to be driving the business here and say, all right, well, we're not going to do business with you. Okay. I has a question. There's a state agency. It's a hybrid. It's uh, audited by the Office of the Inspector General, federal. And the question is, do we know if the OIG works with HHS when determining findings and identifying solutions? Yeah, the answer, the answer to that is, that the app, and that was made clear under the omnibus rule that they absolutely can work together. Yes, yes, the agencies, whether it's the FTC, the, the FTC or some other agency, they can definitely say, "Hey, we're in here doing an audit. It looks like these guys are in willful neglect of the, you know, the HIPAA rules. Uh, you know, please come investigate." Absolutely, they can do that, and they probably are going to do that. 
uh, from the same person, their impact, the impact of the omnibus rule, um, in some cases, uh, touches four individuals, in other circumstances, many more. How should they train their, their workforce? Well, I mean, that's always going to be a question of, you know, you don't have to turn off, you don't have to train your workforce um, all in the same way. But I, I, I got to tell you that in the old HIPAA universe, and when I say old, let's just put this on the table so that everybody understands, right? Prior to the High Tech Act, and even up until the omnibus rule, there wasn't that much enforcement action. But before the High Tech Act, HIPAA was an unenforced paper type. Okay? HIPAA wasn't enforced. That was the dirty little secret in the healthcare industry, and everybody knew it. So whatever you had had never been vetted. Whatever training you had had never been approved because it just wasn't enforced. Okay? So I know that there's a lot of training out there that, that is what I call HIPAA feel-good training. Oh, our nurses don't need to understand that. Oh, our doctors don't need to understand all that. You know, our training takes the opposite approach. Your clinicians, your professionals need to understand the implications of the rule. We don't do HIPAA light training, okay? Because a these these people are one day going to be executives, and b if they if they're not trained correctly, how are they going to know? Here's a test, and I, and, I, and we've been conduct, conducting this test anecdotally. Next time you go to your doctor's office, ask the nurse that comes and takes your vitals if she knows or he knows who their privacy officer is. And I can almost guarantee you the answer is going to be no. And then they get this blank stare in their eyes, you know, and, and that, that deer in the headlights, and, and they, they get a little scared and they say, well, you know, am I supposed to know? Well, yeah, because if you don't even know who your privacy officer is, who would you know to report an incident to or a violation, etc.? And then ask the doctor. Ask the doctor if they know who their privacy officer is, and you're going to get the same deer in the headlights. So, I, you know, I would say train all your professionals, train all your staff pretty rigorously that touch PHI. Don't start making, you know, this feel-good training decisions, because at the end of the day, if you make those and you do this HIPAA light or HIPAA fun or whatever kind of training, it's going to come back on the HIPAA privacy officer or HIPAA security, HIPAA security officer, or if it's the executive or the docs that mandated that feel-good training, it'll come back on them. So, I mean, that's my recommendation, and, if, you know, and I'll just tell you up front, if you're looking for feel-good training, then don't buy our modules because we don't, you know, we do pretty rigorous training. They're about an hour long. There's a test and an answer key, and, you know, it's open slides. You ought to, if you're paying attention, you ought to be able to get a 70, but it's not, it's not feel-good training. Eric would like to know, with the harm threshold being removed, do all violations now have to be reported to HHS? For instance, a business associate emails PHI to the covered entity. Hmm? I mean, if a business associate emails PHI to a covered entity and it's the covered entity's PHI and they're doing it for business reasons, that's not a that's not a violation. I mean, maybe the question is they do it over clear text, but we already talked about that. It's not a per se violation. If you started doing that, if you routinely did that kind of email and somebody intercepted it, you know, that I, I can almost guarantee you that not encrypting it is going to be found to be not reasonable and not appropriate. So you, you're going to get whacked for that. But I'm trying to make a distinction. Is it per se? That's what every, it's on everybody's mind. Is it just illegal just to do it per se? No. The answer is no because encryption is not a required implementation specification, it's addressable. So it's kind of, it's a little bit complicated answer, but if they get caught, they're going to get whacked. But if they don't get caught and they just keep, you know, no, there was no breach, then, you know, it's not a, it's not a per se, it's not a per se violation. Uh, Linda would like to know, where would I go to find options to encrypt data that will comply with the final rules, primarily when sending emails? That's a great question. You're not going to find it in the omnibus rule, but you will find uh, you will find that in the, um, 
interim final rule for breach notification from HHS uh, that think came out in August 2009 that had the uh, that had the recommended protocols for uh, data PHI in motion PHI at rest these are uh, I, I believe they were all NIST protocols that HHS referenced and it said look if you're in, if you implement these protocols um, correctly obviously then you're entitled to the safe harbor so that those guidelines were mandated. HHS was mandated to provide those guidelines through the High Tech Act. They provided that in the interim final rule, uh, and and you got to understand the interim final rule wasn't interim; it was good law. And that's what you know. There's a lot of confusion about what the omnibus rule did. The omnibus rule changed about five percent of stuff. The other ninety-five percent was already uh, good law; it was already in place as an interim final rule. Now. Unfortunately, HHS creates this nomenclature interim that makes people think that it's not applicable, and no, nothing could be further from, from the truth. It's applicable. It's just not finalized. And what the omnibus rule did is it finalized a lot of that. So they didn't repeat the protocols. As, you know, I, I you know I scoured the omnibus rule 500-page PDF. I think where you're going to have to go is that August 2009 uh, interim final rule for breach notification to find out what the protocols are. And, and they are I, almost certainly their NISD National Institute of Standards and Technology protocol. Denise would like to know where can I find 2014 privacy and security training specific to health plans? You know, here's the thing, and I've talked to some health plans lately, and there aren't very you know because because people don't know and they're just starting to become aware, there is very little distinction between what a health plan has to do and what a, a provider has to do, okay? It's like 1% of the privacy rule and security rule that's different. There's not a lot of distinction. So, you know, like for our, our training covers what a health plan has to do in the sense that a health plan has to comply with the privacy rule. A health plan has to comply with the security rule. A health plan has to comply with the breach notification rule. They're all, it's all applicable. Are there differences? Yes. I just named one when we started this thing. The notice of privacy practices, uh, it, 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 uh, the omnibus rule mandated redistribution because of the, you know, pay out of the pocket exception to restrictions. You, uh, providers that are healthcare providers, you know, they just need to do, they just need to distribute the NOPDP to new patients. Health plan needs to distribute it to all, all plan members. There's some other slight differences about hybrid organizations and all that. But as far as complying with the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule, there are no differences in the rules. You have to comply. So there is no specialized training for a health plan, no specialized training for a health care clearinghouse. Uh, the, the specific pieces about being hybrid and not being hybrid, I mean, that part of it, if you're a health care clearinghouse or a health plan, you ought to just know about it. You probably got a staff of lawyers that, have helped you figure that out, but there, there's no differences with, when it comes to complying with, with these particular rules. Alex would like to know, what security is recommended for a business associate performing care gap outreaches? For instance, you are due for an A1C test, patient authentication using date of birth or other patient identifier. You ask me that question again. I'm not. Or ask the person to restate. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Alex, if you could retype that in, we'll go with it again. I'll move on to another one. What counts as the same restrictions on business associates of business associates that the CEBAA often call for, and that I understand the omnibus rule to require? For example, if a business associate's BAA with a CE requires a three-day or less notification by BA to CE of breaches and security incidents, that BA is aware of, does that mean all BAs and BAAs must specify three days or less notification? 
or is a five-day notification requirement an equivalent flow no, down? No, you, the, the answer is well, the answer is yes. Yes, those restrictions that a CE puts in. First of all, it's a contract. It's a contract between the CE and the VA. Okay, and the CEs, it's negotiable, sort of. But like any other contract, some, the party with economic power usually gets their way. Okay, but it's a it's a contract. It's not nobody's got a gun to someone said and make me sign this thing. Obviously, if you want to do business with the CE, you you probably agree to the restrictions. But if you have subcontractors, the VA now has subcontractors. Those restrictions have to be passed on to the sub. If the sub has a sub, those restrictions have to be passed all the way down the line. They have to be passed all the way down the line. The Omnibus Rule Commentary uh, made that clear, and that makes sense because you know why 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 would why would the covered entity want to restrict something and then allow the VA to unrestrict it? That that just wouldn't make either uh, privacy sense or business sense to to allow that. So those those restrictions have to ripple down. Heidi would like to know they're starting someone on a HHS privacy audit pro protocol. It's extremely lengthy. Any wisdom or insight on how to start, build the team? Work front to back, front back to front, set X amount of side to side, et cetera. Well, my, the biggest, the most important piece of wisdom is get started, okay? Get started. And if you want to, if you, want to uh, you know, figure out what the protocol ought to be, you know, I'm going to suggest to you that the protocol is going to be Make sure you audit that you're meeting every requirement of the privacy rule and the security rule. Well, that really, you know, it's a daunting task if you just start looking at those things. Now, so our privacy rule checklist, just to make clear, and I'm, I'm, I'm specifically doing a shameless plug here to make a point, it walks you through every requirement of the privacy rule, every single one, and it suggests what your policy ought to be. It suggests what processes you should implement that underpin that policy, and it makes suggestions with respect to tracking mechanisms to ensure that you're tracking process results for that requirement. Now, if you can show that you have visible, demonstrable evidence for every requirement of the privacy rule, that's as good as it gets. If, it, if you can show that you've made 35% progress, but you've got the remaining to do, but you've got a plan to do it, that's next best, right? And since nobody's going to be able to do this in a day, a month, this is, you know, you're going to be working on this for a while. Maybe not full time, but you got to stand up a program. You got to have a methodology. That's the methodology that I would recommend. We're going to do the same thing with our security rule checklist when it comes out on 1015 or before. Every single requirement of the security rule will have a policy, suggested processes, suggested tracking mechanisms, and you know, you can walk down. There's a scorecard. I've done 10 of these. I haven't done the rest, and then. I, I would build your program around some sort of me methodology that does that. It's at every requirement, and then you can do self-audits, which you're required to do anyway. That's, the, you know, like the eighth standard of the administrative safeguards in the, uh, in the security rule is evaluation. You're required to do self-audits. If you're not doing self-audits, you really can't m uh, manage what you don't measure. So, yes, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's, it's uh it can be quite daunting. I would say, you know, that there are some tools out there that that, that can help. But if you want to, if you want to roll your own or invent your own, then that's the process I would follow: is walk through every requirement and, and make sure you got a policy, processes, and tracking mechanisms that cover it. Debbie would like to know: We are a hospice. Is our nursing home, college, nursing students, ambulance, X-ray? DME contracts considered BAA agreements, and if so, do we need to send them the BAA amendment for HIPAA updates? BAA amendment for HIPAA updates. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what a BAA amendment for HIPAA updates is, but the, the question is, the, the, these types of professionals, people are going to, can only fall into two camps, okay? One is you might you can make an argument that nursing students 
are under your under the direct supervision of some professional in your organization, and therefore they're part of your workforce. So that there's that workforce. The definition of workforce is not just W two employees. Okay, it really is if somebody is under the direct supervision of someone in your organization. It could even be an independent contractor. You got an independent contractor that shows up on site every day, 365, and they they directly report to somebody. They probably could. You can make an argument they're part of our workforce, and we don't need uh, a, a, a BAA agreement with them. If they are not part of your workforce, if not under the direct supervision, and you know they're using PHI before some business function, then they're going to be a, a business associate, and you have to have the agreement. That's how. That's how you make the distinction. They're either going to be part of your workforce because you directly have full control over them, or not. Okay. Marianne has sent, as a, as a BA, been proactive and has sent the CE an, an agreement to sign. The CE ignores it. Does the BA continue to do business with them? And the well, you know, that's a, that, I mean, that's a business. You're going to be in violation. If you don't have an agreement, you're going to be in violation. Both parties are going to be in violation. That, that part is clear, right? Whether you continue to do business with them, you need to understand that risk, you know, that you're probably in willful neglect. I mean, that's mandated. You've got to have an agreement between the parties. No agreement, you know, that's 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 not a good thing. I mean, obviously, I understand that, you know, some providers have been laggards and some old docs, you know, say, I'd rather go to jail than comply with this freaking mess and, you know, blah, 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 or I'm going to retire in two years and, you know, the government can do you know what, but, you know, I, I mean, it may take it may take a generation of these old docs dying, but the, you know to, to get everybody to come around. But the, yeah, you're going to be in violation if you don't have VA. No way around it. Michelle writes: Temp employees hired for central scheduling of our patients. Do they need a BA? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same answer. Who's got full control? Who's got direct control? They're either they're members of your workforce. You might be able to make the argument for a temp. Uh, employee that you know what I mean that you have full control and you know uh, they only see PHI that you let them see on your site blah blah so therefore they're a member of your workforce uh, if you can't make that argument then they're you know they're a BA and those are the options right there's not 20 options there's either a member of your workforce or they're a business associate um, if a nurse is texting or paging a doctor and he loses his smartphone or pager and the device contains a boatload of PHI. Who is liable? Well, it's probably going to be the the the, the practice is definitely going to be uh, liable because you know that's going to be almost a breach by definition because you're not going to be able to prove you're not going to be able to prove that there, that there's a low probability that the PHI wasn't compromised, right? So you got you got a smartphone. Thousands of records of PHI, unprotected, unencrypted. God knows what happened to it. That's a presumed breach. So just just to be clear, it's presumed to be a breach now under those scenarios. The the harm, you know, the harm threshold analysis that's gone. Okay, it's presumed to be a breach. And then the BA uh, or the CE, depending on what whose information system got compromised, it, uh, you know, has the burden of proof to show a low probability that the PHI was compromised. You've got an unencrypted phone with thousands of records of the PHI that got lost. Good luck trying to trying to meet that standard. I, I mean, your lawyer couldn't even make that argument with a straight face. That's a breach. You're going to have to report it. The practice is definitely going to be liable. Could the executive, could the doctor be liable? Potentially. That's where we started, right? Potentially. If the doctor said, oh, I don't care, let him put me in jail. We've been doing this forever, blah, blah, blah. You know, and somehow convince the privacy officer to go along. Well, you know, there you have it. There are criminal penalties. There, you know, there are definitely criminal penalties that apply to individuals. You know, we we got to allow the courts to weigh in. Nothing that I've seen so far would preclude a, a, a civil penalty potentially, but I I haven't read anything directly from um, HHS other than kind of that space they left open. And, they left open in the, in the introduction, so uh, it's possible both the practice and the 
and the doctor, maybe even the nurse, if the nurse knew. You know, so, yeah, there's lots of liability to be spread around there. Mike would like to know about uh, the HIPAA definition security incident includes attempted unauthorized access to EPHI. Does the company have to report on all attempted unauthorized access to EPHI? This would require reporting pings on external firewalls that did nothing. Just about no. every business. No, yeah. I, so I get the question. It's a, it's a really good question. Yes, the definition of security incident is attempted or successful. Well, no. I mean, if there was an attempt and the, and the EPHI was encrypted according to the protocols where you get the safe harbor, well, then that's not a breach by definition because the PHI has been rendered unreadable, unusable, or undecipherable to an unauthorized individual. But here's the thing. All security incidents have to be logged. You don't have to report them all, but if you're not logging attempts, then you're in violation. You got to, an attempt is a loggable incident. It just doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's a reportable uh, incident. Amanda, other than having new business associates agreements signed and on file, what are the requirements for a physician's office? How do you train the staff? Uh, well, uh, like I said, I, you know, our training is pretty rigorous. We go through the privacy rule requirements. We break it up into uses and disclosures. We break it up into the patient's bill of rights, which means, you know, all that, uh, all that is part of the, the, the privacy rule, how patients can get access, how many days you have to give them access, you know, the fact that uh, the 60 days that used to be uh, in play if, it was, if the PHI was off-site, in the paper world, that's being cut to 30. I mean, your staff needs to be aware of all that. That's what I'm saying. It, you know, you can't get by with this feel-good training because the feel-good training never covered that. And to be honest, it didn't need to cover it because HIPAA was unenforced. That's what's changed. The world changed with the High Tech Act because now it is informed. And now you can get whacked up to 1.5 million per identical violation. Right? Under HIPAA, you could get a slap on the wrist for $25,000. You know, and, and under HIPAA, you know, I didn't see very many class action lawsuits for breach notification. Okay, so it, there's, there's just a lot more, uh, a, a lot more liability out there, uh, including, including uh, you know, law firms bringing class action lawsuits based on some negligence theory of, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. One, one could be you didn't train your staff appropriately. And because you didn't train your staff appropriately, that's the reason that all these records got uh, released. And because a, 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 a patient doesn't have a private right to sue under HIPAA, the old HIPAA or the new HIPAA. Right? The only people that can bring an action is HHS, probably through, through the DOJ and state attorney generals, if you complain to your state attorney general. But nobody's precluded from bringing a, a state law action based on state law that either allows it or under some negligence theory, okay? So clever law firms, you know, they, they're going to find ways to bring causes of action. One would be you, you, you were negligent because you didn't train your staff appropriately. Another would be you were negligent because you didn't get, sat, you didn't get the required satisfactory assurances from your BA. Oh, but we got a, we got a contract. Well, what was the, well, tell me about the due diligence. What kind of due diligence did you do? Did you ever inspect the VA's security program, privacy program? Did you ever even review their policies? Did you ever at, even ask them when they train their staff, right? And so in the case of a breach, you know, the, the, the whole belly of the whale opens up for, for negligence theory. Okay, along the training again, is HIPAA training required annually, or do you follow your state regulations? Well, you're going to have to follow. Your, look, the HIPAA rules don't specify how you. They're not prescriptive. They're descriptive. They, they say you got to provide training when, when you know, when there are material changes. Well, first of all, you got to train everybody. So you got to make sure that everybody has gotten the training, and then all new people have gotten the training at least once. And then you have to train. You know, whenever there are material changes to the law, that's
that's the privacy rule. Security rule, you have to have security reminders that are sent out and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I would say, you know, you're probably going to be doing training once a year. But any state law, and everybody's going to have to comply with their own state laws, that is more stringent than HIPAA, right? So HIPAA is federal law that occupies the space, except if a state law is more stringent. And that goes back to the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution that federal laws preempt state laws. But all the state laws, the state legislators are really clever. They all write their laws that, so they're more stringent. So you're going to have to you have to comply with both. I mean, if there's a state law that says you've got to do privacy training every six months, then you definitely have to comply with that because it's more stringent than the HIPAA rule. Is a BA legally responsible for paying costs for an action, actions to improve a CE's Im image after a data breach by the BA? Well, you, you know, what's, uh, what's legal? Uh, and please don't, don't email me with questions like that because that's legal advice and I can't answer it unless you want to hire me as your lawyer and then I'll be happy to answer those kinds of questions but uh, look a, a lot of covered entities are becoming savvy and they're looking for and they're looking for indemnification and they're looking to put and are putting indemnification clauses in to the BAA and what you need to understand is that a BAA has certain statutory requirements certain clauses that have to be in it but other than that it's just a regular old contract that the parties can put whatever the parties put in the contract okay so whatever they agree to so a, a covered entity puts an indemnification clause that if a PHI, uh, if your PHI under your control and your information system blows up, I get brand damage, I'm going to sue you, you have to indemnify me, and the BA is foolish enough to sign that thing, then yes, it's private law. That contract is not, the contract is likely enforceable. I mean, look, you can make private law almost about anything you want, under U.S. jurisprudence except for something that's illegal, okay, and something that's unconscionable. Well, indemnification clauses are all over the place in contracts. I don't think they'd be found to be unconscionable. They're certainly not illegal. So, yes, if there's an indemnification clause that reads something like that, then, then the CE is going to sue on the contract. It's not a HIPAA rule. It's not a rate. It's not a state law. They're going to sue on the contract because the BAA signed the contract. Is there a requirement under HIPAA security rule for the character length of passwords? For instance, six or eight characters. No, there's no, there's no. Um, like I said, the the, the the privacy rule and security rule are both descriptive. They don't ever prescribe, you know, like strong passwords. But the way they get around that is they say, what's well, reasonable and appropriate? Well, we all know that now, in this day and age that we live in, Facebook 24-7 online world, 365, you know, strong passwords are reasonable and appropriate. And modifying passwords from time to time are reasonable and appropriate. So if you don't do these things that are reasonable and appropriate, you're going to get whacked. But there's no, there's no definition of character length for a password. You're not going to find anything specific like that. Uh, in either the privacy rule or the security rule. Uh, Mark would like to know if you're not engaged in fundraising, do you still have to address the topic in your NOP? No, but I mean, no. I mean, you don't have to address something that you're not you're not engaged in. I would I would say though, I would address it. I would say we're not going to contact you for fundraising. Be done with it. You know, but no. I mean, you don't have to. You know, just like if you don't keep psychotherapy notes, you don't have to put that in your in your not, not or every other potential authorization that could be out there. It's intended it's intended it's intended to communicate what you will do with, with PHI and if you're not going to fundraise and you're not going to market, I would say be transparent. Put it in there. We're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, but you don't have to Sharon would like to know in obtaining a BAA, at what level should the signature come from? the individual representative who comes in, or a specific person or office within the company? I, I mean, you know, if I'm representing the parties, I'm going to want the principal, the executives of both or 
organization, some officer of your of both organizations to sign this thing. I'm not going to, you know, I, I would not be inclined to accept the, you know, BAA signature from a, the sales rep, right? Uh, I mean, that just, you know, that might that might lead to, you know, you didn't do your proper due diligence. Get an officer of the organization to sign it. You may negotiate with an officer of the organization. Otherwise. You know, somebody can make an argument. You didn't really do the. You didn't really get the satisfactory assurance. Did you let a sales rep that once that's paid, you know, paid on commission sign this thing? Probably not going to apply. In a declared disaster, is there any time where HIPAA is suspended? For instance, if prescription drugs are being dispensed through public health agencies. Yeah, there are exceptions, common sense exceptions for uh, disasters and what you need to do. And you know what I mean? Nobody, nobody is going to allow lives to be lost because the HIPAA would have been violated in the disaster emergency situation. You know, and and so you just got to use your professional judgment at that point and do and do the right thing. You can't obviously you can't lose lives because HIPAA may have been violated when. There's a an, an emergency or a disaster afoot. If PHI is provided by a CE to its liability insurance carrier for a claim, is a BAA required? Yeah, well, it's not for treatment purposes. You know that that insurance company is performing a business function on behalf of the CE or through the scene with a patient and PHI is involved, I think those guys are business associates by definition. It's not for treatment, right? You don't need a business associate agreement when you refer and you pass PHI on to a specialist. That's that's for treatment purposes. You don't, you know, that's an exception. Anita would like to know if a patient requests restriction of disclosure to a health plan, and she stopped her question there. Does the CE have to provide paper prescription lab orders for the patient? Okay, I think what, um, who's the questioner? Anita. Okay, so Anita, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I understand the drift of your, your question. Look, in, in, in the old HIPAA, covered entities, especially providers, were not required. They were required to allow people to make requests for restrictions. They were required to make to make them make those requests for restrictions in writing. They were not required to honor any restrictions at all. Absolutely not required to honor them at all. And you know, my uh, preference was and don't honor them because they become really complicated to track. You got to set flags that you got this restriction in place, and you know what I mean. If you slip up, it's too easy to slip up. But, but. The High Tech Act and the Omnibus Rule made one exception, and that's the principal reason why you have to update your NOPP, and that's the restriction based on whether a uh, patient pays out of pocket in full, and then ask that the provider not pass this information along to the insurance plan. Okay, and it could be the patient's uncle or aunt or mother or father or some third party that pays for it in full. It doesn't matter. As long as it's paid in full, then the patient can restrict that, and that restriction has to be honored. Okay? And the omnibus rule says that the provider has to cooperate with the patient. So, and it specifically cites that use case that Anita just presented, is that in don't issue a, a, an e-prescription, make out a paper prescription so that the patient at least has the opportunity to take that and go ask the pharmacy, I don't want this to be passed along to my health plan because I paid in full, yada, yada, yada. And yes, the, 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 the provider has a, the affirmative duty to cooperate, but this is a really big but. It, the burden is on the patient for all downstream to notify all downstream providers of that restriction. It is not the covered entity's responsibility to identify every provider, uh, you know, in 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 town.
town that might the, that this patient may go to about this restriction it's the patient's responsibility now how the patient is going to go about doing that 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 part is unclear but the the, the use case about the the pharmacy and the paper prescription that was the hypothetical that HHS talked about in the omnibus rule and to that degree the uh, providers required to cooperate uh, Tim would like to know if a private practitioner is a cash only and doesn't accept assignment or file insurance, are they required to comply with HIPAA as a CE? Yes. That, I mean, I mean, there's part of HIPAA that deals with transaction sets and all that, but you know, we're talking about privacy and security. That has nothing to do with whether the covered entity accepts cash cows, chickens, or whatever else. they got to comply with the privacy and security rules. How would you suggest a CE with 100 BAs handle the HIPAA compliance of its BAs? Should they ask uh, the BA? Okay, okay very go care, very, very carefully. <laughs> I mean, look, it's the same answer. you gotta have, you got to have a BA. If you want to satisfy satis the, the, the satisfactory assurances clause, you better perform some sort of due diligence. If I'm counsel for the covered entity, I'm saying at least, and in our model contract, this is what we say, covered entity has the right to inspect your policies, procedures, tracking mechanisms, and you are to make them available, Mr. or Mrs. BA, within five business days of notice so that we can inspect and, you know, uh, and then, you know, I would advise to do some due diligence up front to make sure that you're dealing with a reputable BA that understands what it means to comply with the privacy and security rule. Now, if you just willy-nilly send out BAs, have people sign them and think that you're good, that might have worked in the old HIPAA universe, and that's not going to work now. Okay. Um, how does an employee know if a security incident has it occurred, such as phishing, hacking? What are the signs electronically? Well, an employee is not going to know. I mean, an employee may or may not know, you know, but... The security rule requires the business associate or the covenant entity to train their people as to various ways that malicious software gets introduced into your organization. That's part of your security rule training, and you're also uh, mandated to implement a security reminder system. So the only way that an employee is going to know is if they were trained. Good point. Well, they may, there are maybe other ways if the, if the employee is you know, technically savvy and understands these things, but the requirement is for the BA and CE to train. Back to uh, Marcus and the janitor question. If he's not an employee but a contracted ser service, is a confidentiality agreement still required? There's nothing in HIPAA that talks about confidentiality. You know, that that's a private matter. Okay? There's, and the guidance has been... If it's incidental too, and they use janitorial janitorial services, then a BA is not required. If you want a CYA, you know, and there's probably good reason to, then I, you know, I would vet them and have a confidentiality agreement, provide them some training, just so that you can say you did. Now, why? Why would you want to do that, even though the HIPAA says it's not? Because a state law suit based on negligence doesn't care about HIPAA. Okay, they're gonna. They're going to bring that action on a state law theory of negligence. And so uh, what I'm trying to share with you is there's lots of liability out there. Yes, some of it comes from HIPAA, but some of it comes from outside HIPAA. And HIPAA doesn't preempt state law negligence lawsuits. Um, Michelle has a few questions here, but they all concern BAs. Um, does it? NSF need a BAA with the county public health for social workers. I don't know what an NSF is, so I need a SNF. I don't know what that is either. Okay. Um, let's see. The three questions, Michelle, we can't really answer at this point. I mean, if somebody can provide me with an SNF, I mean, it's going to go back to, I, I, I know it's the same question being raised 20 different ways with specifics, and you're trying to get specifics, but it's going to come down to this. They're either a member of your workforce, and they're, you have them directly under your control, 
Okay, now assuming that they use PHI to perform a business function on your behalf. They're either a member of your workforce or they're a business associate. Those are the only two options. They're going to fall into one or the other, assuming they're using PHI to perform some business function on your behalf. Okay, and you can go back to first principles, use that as the foundation to answer the question. Do I need to keep a, a lot of copies of my NOP in my waiting room, or can I have my receptionist hand it out if requested? Yeah, I mean, you can have your, you can have, I mean, again, the, the, the privacy rule is not going to prescribe how, how you manage that. I mean, manage it in the way that, that, that makes sense. You, can, you know, your, your receptionist can hand it out and make sure that it's signed, and, and if a patient refuses to sign, make sure that that gets logged. Um, I wouldn't keep those things today in, in, in a paper format after you get it back from the client. I would scan it and keep it with all other documents related to the patient, like authorizations, restrictions, and all that would be what I would call a compliance repository. That's just a fancy word for a place, could be just a fancy word for a place on the network where you keep all your compliance stuff. Well, what compliance stuff? Well, your policy, your procedures, tracking results all the information around VAs that you got to have, all the information around patients. Why do you want that? Well, you want it on your network because you want it on a place that's getting backed up, and you want a single version of the truth so that if you have an audit, you know where to go find all these things. They're not spread all over five or six different PCs in the office or, you know, five or six different servers or you can't find them. Some are paper-based. I mean, I would create a repository and put all that stuff in it, but you manage it, manage it in a way that it's, works for your organization. Uh, we have an answer on NSF. It's a skilled nursing facility for future reference. Yes, yeah, so, right, it, I mean, if they're providing temp help and, you know, uh, they're on site and you can make an argument that they're part of your workforce because you have full control, then they're part of your workforce and you don't need a VA. If you, uh, if that's not true, if they really, you know, uh, provide services but they can swap nurses in and out and make those kind of decisions that aren't under your control, then they're probably a VA and you got to have a VA agreement. That's going to be true for that whole use case around these third parties. You're going to have to make that determination. Are they part of our workforce? How much control do we have over them? Or no, we don't have that much control. So, you know, there's no bright line rules that you're going to find. There's no HHS guidance that you're going to find a specific answer to that question. You're going to have to go uh, either, make, either read the regs and make that determination or get the uh, assistance of outside counsel to help you make that determination. This is from Marianne. Are there restrictions for a BA doing business with a subcontractor outside the USA? Does the BA notify the CE of subs who may have a contract with CE's, may have contact with CE's PHI? Uh, you know, in our model contract, we're going to want to know who the subs are, right? Because this whole question of, of obviously, if you're doing medical trans trans transcriptionists or answering services in the Philippines, China, blah, 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 and you're sharing PHI, then those are business associates, but they don't fall under, you know, I mean, they're quasi-business associates, but they're not, they don't, U.S. law doesn't reach them. But you better have a contract in place because that doesn't, the fact that they're international doesn't relieve you of the liability. You just can't willy-nilly outsource the liability because now you're using somebody in China. You better have them sign the contract, and that contract should say everything that a BA, they agree to do everything that a BA would have to do if the BA was an American uh, business entity, and further, they agree to American jurisdiction in this county, this federal court, this state court. If they don't do that, then, you know, you have a high risk that, that you just outsource the liability, and that is, is not going to be found to be reasonable and appropriate. You can't outsource the liability through the use of VAs or international VAs. So nothing, nothing, nothing clever like that is going to get anybody off the hook. Okay, Michelle would like to know. Any vendor having access to your PHI, they should have a BAA, question mark. Yes. Like a support vendor, right? 
technical support. That's one of the you know that's one of the use cases that come up all the time. You got Microsoft or you know Epic or whatever, and their Epic's people are dialing in to look at your database to troubleshoot problems. They're not really part of your workforce now. If they're located on site all the time, maybe, but yeah, they're 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 technical support. They're a VA. They're a business associate, just like a lawyer would be. If a lawyer comes into your premises or or or, or your CPA and starts looking at PHI to perform their business function, they're a business associate, and that lawyer and that CPA have to comply. And that that's been true forever. That was in the old days, but that's nothing new. That, I mean, you can look at the definition of business associate. It says lawyers, accountants, actuaries, yada, yada. Are funeral homes considered a VA or a subcontractor? Same, the same definition applies. Are, are you exchanging PHI? Well, you know, are they part of your workforce? No, they're not part of your workforce. Now, the omnibus, uh, the omnibus rule did say that PHI, PHI, I don't know of any funeral, you know, home exception. So I'm, I'm going to go with the stock answer. Right? You're not going to find a funeral home exception anywhere in the privacy and security rule or the breach notification rule. Now, you know, PHI of a deceased plus 50 years, that's not PHI anymore. That omnibus rule changed that, and the definition of PHI changed. Okay, that doesn't mean that PHI has to be kept for death plus 50 years. That just means after 50 years of death, it's no longer PHI. Okay, uh, but you know there aren't any funeral home exceptions. Can you clarify? I, I example: There are all kinds of like fire department, county agencies, all kinds of players that use PHI to perform a business function on behalf of a covered entity. They're BAs by definition. There's just a ton more cooks in the kitchen. Well, they've always been BAs. It's just now that they're on, now they're on the hook a lot more. Can you speak to an agency relationship? Yes. So agency is a legal term of art, and the United States Supreme Court, um, in a case, I think it's community something or other. I, I, I abbreviated CCNB versus Reed, V Reed, R E I D. You can Google that, uh, and you'll find the case. It gives like 14 factors to determine if one entity is an agent of another. And it really has to do with how much control uh, Entity A has over Entity B. I'll give you, uh, in all those examples where somebody was a member of your workforce, they're an agent, even if they're an independent contractor. If they're on site and you you have full control over them, they're going to be an agent. They're going to be treated as an agent, right? Just like everybody, your employees are treated as agents. Uh, so, you know, it, let's say, for example, you have a family uh, practice three or four docs, you know, I don't know how many nurse practitioners, whatever, and, you know, the principal doctor has his brother-in-law doing as a CPA, but he does nothing more than the work for this particular practice. You know, the, the doctor tells him what hours to work, you know, makes him come into the office. But, I mean, you can make an argument, and, and that's the only source of income. There is no other income from any other clients. You can make an argument that that CPA is an agent because, you know, because the practice has full control of their economic uh, reality. And, but it's a 14-factor test, so there's no bright-line rules, right? If you're looking at agency, um, HHS has made clear it's the federal law of agency, and the leading case is this CCN versus Reed, where the Supreme Court laid out these 14 factors, and it, it boils down to how much control one entity has over another. Are CEs requ required to do active auditing of their BA security policies and procedures? They're required. Both parties are required to actively monitor the contract for material breach, which means you can't look the other way. There is no requirement to actively monitor 24-7, you know, the other person's operations because that would be an impossibility and business would never get done. But if you don't have some way of getting satisfactory assurances, 
And who knows what satisfactory assurances mean? That's like the reasonable person standard in negligence, right? Sooner or later, a federal court is going to is going to really define what satisfactory assurances means with respect to a VA and what reasonable and appropriate methods are with respect to the security rule. But uh, you know, that's where the hook is. Did you did you know you're not required to monitor 27 somebody's operations? But did you? The hook is going to come back to you know, did you get satisfactory assurances? And that's, you know, from a negligence perspective, that's where the, the state law claims would probably find an opening. Okay. <clears throat> Rose would like to know, do you need a, to document the activity uh, an RAC auditor in the accounting of disclosure? The activity of an auditor? RAC auditor. Does somebody help me out here? What 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 is RAC? Now, if we get an answer to the question, we'll go back to that. Um. Who is responsible whose responsibility is it to initiate the BIA. Is it the entity that creates, receives, or maintains, transmits the PHI, or is it the C's responsibility to initiate a BA with their vendors? It's both. It's both. They're both on the hook now. They're, you, the, the, the business associate is statutory on, statutorily on the hook, all right, for the privacy rule and the security rule. Both of them say you've got to have a BAA agreement. The covered entity is statutorily on the hook the responsibility of both. There's no one party that's got more or less responsibility. Okay, let's see if I got an answer. Um, fundraising. With the fundraising and the ability now to use the physician's name, does, the, does this include nurse practitioners? Yeah, I mean, fundraising activities is going to include anybody in the practice that is you know that that is fundraising, and you know that that's one of the that that's one of the areas of the omnibus rule where a lot of time was spent. You can go back and look at the slides. You know, you have to absolutely um, give a a first of all put that in your NOPP that you're going to be doing that, and that, and absolutely give people a a a conspicuous opt out choice to opt out of any uh, of this fundraising communication and all others. So when they opt out, you got to treat it as an opt out of all future fundraising. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to make a difference what, whose name you use in the communication. According to the new breach notification standards, a CE must notify an individual if that individual I'm sorry, and it stops right there, but I would assume if that individual's PHI has been compromised. CEs always have to notify. First of all, it's the CE that notifies. BAs don't notify. I mean, BAs have to notify the CE, and a sub of a BA has to, sub, have to notify the, its BA up, up the chain. But CE has to notify, and patients always, patients always have to be notified. Okay, HHS always has to be notified. The only difference is... If it was 500 or more, uh, you got to notify, I believe it's 500, not 501, 500 or more uh, records, PHI records that were compromised, then you got to notify HHS uh, as soon as reasonable and appropriate, no later than 60 days. If it was just one or two records, uh, then you got to notify HHS within 60 days of the end of the calendar year. So... You're always going to have to notify individuals. You're always going to have to notify HHS. And depending on the circumstances, you may have to notify major media. Okay. Michael would like to know, can I request a CE to add me as a W-2 part-time employer, employee, rather, in order to reduce my liability? <laughs> you can, uh, yes, you can ask. I mean, there's nothing illegal about asking. You know, they, I mean, uh, you know, a, a, 
a covered entity can hire an employee anytime they want, and you know, a covered entity can employ, can convert an independent contractor to an employee anytime they want. That's a private agreement between parties. Yeah, you can you can ask. There's no, you know, there's no guarantee that see you got to say yes. There's no requirement. I mean, there's no HIPAA requirement around that. <clears throat> can you briefly summarize? The changes that went into effect on 923. And the summary is really in the slides, and we have another um, that we give away with every product, and it's actually out on the HIPAA Survival Guide. There's a there's a pretty lengthy summary of all the changes from the omnibus rule. Just do omnibus rule summary in Google, and I, I think we come up first. That's, I mean, it was a 500-page PDF. Our summary was 14 pages, so, you know, I'm not really going to do it justice here in 30 seconds. A bank would be required to sign a BAA as they process copay checks? Yeah, I mean, it's the same definition of BA. Are they using PHI, right? No. Yes. If they're using PHI, then they got it, then, then they're a BA. All right, so we're at, we're at, an hour and a half. Martin, we'll take one final question and we'll wrap it up. Okay. No more questions? Um, no, I'm, I'm trying to pick one here. If BAA agreements were compliant prior to the omnibus rule, what key items would need to be checked for compliance with the omnibus? There were some changes. Um, there were there, yeah, I mean, you're grandfathered in if you had what the HHS said, a high-tech ready uh, BAA agreement prior to the omnibus rule, then you were supposedly grandfathered in for uh, a year. That means high-tech ready. That means you may change it to, you may change this to it based on the high-tech act, but you hadn't made the changes to it with respect to the omnibus rule. We, we did find that there were small changes that had to be made to our model BAA agreement for the omnibus rule. So, uh, but you're grandfathered in for a year if you had a, an otherwise high-tech ready, like ours was high-tech ready before the omnibus rule. If you had purchased one of ours, you'd be grandfathered in for a year. Okay, that's it. Let's wrap it up. Thank you uh, for listening. We're going to be doing more of these uh, twice a month, you know, unless we notify otherwise. You check with, uh, with the newsletter. It'll be the second and fourth Thursday, and we're going to be... Uh, Cranking up five-minute Fridays on Blog Talk Radio. It's been my pleasure being with you guys today.